Okay, so chapter 9 is all about physical and chemical control of microbes. And I will tell you that I am using Mrs. Rhodes' PowerPoint, but it is very similar to what I would do anyway. So we're going to just use this and I will record lecture using her PowerPoint. Okay, so <clears throat> chapter 9 is about controlling microbes outside of the body and chapter 10 is about controlling microbes inside of the body okay so we're con concerned with controlling or reducing our exposure to potentially harmful microbes or potential pathogens and so one of the things that we we look at is how we can do that and we can sterilize things and we use sterilized equipment um, we can disinfect surfaces. Um, we use antisepsis when we are cleaning skin and living tissue. Um, and there's also something called a decontamination or sanitization process. There is also a, a process that we'll talk about call, called de-germing. Um, I hate that term, but it's something that they talk about. So bear with me. Um, hang on. Okay, now you can see it. Um, <laughs> sterilization destroys all microbes, um, and their endospores. So it is a very important thing to understand. There will be no living anything when we're done. Okay. It'll also take care of destruction of all viruses. So it, it gets rid of all endospores that could continue to give life later um, it can get rid of the viable organisms that are there and the active viruses All right. um, we do not sterilize people you can't sterilize a person if you sterilize a person they will die okay we rely on our microflora too much to be able to try to sterilize ourselves Okay. Disinfection, um, we're trying to get rid of pathogens, okay, um, but disinfection is not going to take care of endospores, so you're still going to have the, the, the possibility that something is left behind that can be regenerate into new cells, um, and they're, you're constantly worrying about making sure that you're, you're, taking care of um pathogens it's a pathogen thing okay decontamination or sanitization is a cleaning technique it, it is not where you're trying to destroy things it's also called de-germing um, you're not destroying things, you're sanitizing stuff. So you're bringing the contamination levels down to a safe level. It will not destroy endospores. It may not do, it may or may not uh, affect some of the viruses. Um, and some of the, the more resistant organisms may live through this and you don't really get rid of everything. Um, antisepsis where is where we're reducing the number of microbes that are on the human skin um and you know that's a, a really good thing it can be done through the simple process of of friction um or applying chemicals okay all right <clears throat> um in your book there is a a picture that shows the resistance of organisms and it has those enveloped viruses are, are pretty easy to destroy and and prions are extremely t hard to to destroy it gives resistance of these things bacterial endospores are are um very resistant to control measures and they are not the most resistant but they're the most resistant that we're going to be talking about because we're not going to be talking about prions okay um so if because of the nature of the endospore and them being very 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 resistant 
um, and having those protein C coats on them, if we can destroy an endospore, we can say, you know what, everything else that is less resistant than this, it has to have been destroyed. So that is why when we're using sterilization techniques, we are actually checking, we'll check the sterilization methods with little control vials that have endospores in them to find out if um, the sterilization actually worked. So the goal of sterilization is to destroy all living matters, okay, including endospores, okay. Using an autoclave uses steam and high heat. So the goal of an autoclave is to get to 121 degrees Celsius and hold the pressure at 15 pounds of pressure per square inch. Um, and we hold it at that temperature for and, and pressure for 15 to 20 minutes. And if we can do that for like 20 minutes, then we can guarantee that those endospores will not um, be viable when they're, when it's over. Okay. There are sterilants, like certain gases that can be used to, um, destroy all of the living matter as well. Um, so ethylene oxide is one of those gas sterilants that can be used to destroy all matter of life. Okay. Um, Disinfection, again, no endospores, okay? Sanitization, again, no endospores, and this is just really you're reducing things to a safe level for public use. That's really what sanitization is. Getting the numbers of organisms down to a level that is safe for public use. Um, and antisepsis, of course, is um, de -germ getting rid of the pathogens and organisms that are on living skin. Okay, so <clears throat> sterilization and disinfection can be physical processes, okay? Um, so these are processes, things that are doing. So there is something called a disinfectant. There is something called a sterilant, right? Those are the agents that we use to do, to get the, make these processes happen. So, um, some disinfectants are sporicidal, meaning they have the ability to destroy that endospore so that that endospore will not be able to create another viable organism. Okay. So, sidal means it's got the ability to kill. Static means that it'll inactivate that particular organism. Um, now, it does not mean that it is a permanent thing. I, I, and I, I, it can be permanent, but it may not be. So, what happens is if you have that um, bacteria static uh, agent in the presence of bacterium and it stays there for the entire time, then that bacterium will not be able to multiply and reproduce and become um, actively re grow. Okay. But if that bacteria static agent is weakened or is removed, then those microorganisms that were in the presence of that agent may be able to become active, reproduce, multiply, and grow. Okay. So as long as that agent is there, the organisms are going to be inactivated. But if it's removed or weakened in any way, shape, or form, then they, it may not be as effective. So, um, Bactericidal means that it's going to destroy and kill the bacteria. Bacteria is static. It prevents the growth of the bacteria, um, prevents the, the multiplication. It prevents the reproduction. Okay. Um, a sporicide will destroy the bacterial endospores. Okay. So, 
Antiseptics and drugs often have a microbiostatic effect. Okay. Um, because if it was microbicidal, they could actually also destroy our human cells. Okay. So there are, there is that whole thing where you have to keep it in your system at a certain concentration for an extended period of time to be able to get rid of the infection. So if you skip doses, miss doses of your antibiotics, sorry, um, or you don't take it for the entire time, well, guess what? You just gave um, the keys to the teenager. I am so sorry. What in the world did I just do? Hang on. I'm getting there. Nope. Back one. Two. Three. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> That's what I get for messing with my keyboard while I'm trying to um, lecture. So. <coughs> excuse me. So. We need to keep all of those antibiotics in our system for a certain period of time, right? To be able to keep those bacteria, I'm going to go with bacteria, um, inhibited and so that they can, until our immune system can take over and eradicate them. Okay. So it's not just the drug that gets rid of them. You also have an immune response and you have an immune system that is helping to destroy these things as well. Okay. But the, there are some drugs that we take that will actually not allow the, the cells to replicate. Okay. So if you only have a few cells and they can't replicate and they can't reproduce because they can't make their cell walls, then it's going to be kind of tragic to the cell because the few that you have that are there that are trying to replicate and they can't. Yeah. Um, they're going to be taken out by your white cells and you're going to get rid of that infection very quickly. Okay. Um, sepsis is when you have microorganisms in or their toxins in the blood or other deep tissues. Okay. So tissues or blood, blood is a tissue just so you know. Um, but typically we say that a patient is septic when they've either got organism in their bloodstream or they've got toxins that were produced by an organism in their bloodstream. Okay. Asepsis, um, and we talk about aseptic techniques because we did that lab way long time ago. Um, aseptic technique, um, helps to prevent the entry of infectious agents into or tissues to prevent infection. So using aseptic techniques helps to keep the bad guys where we want them and the good guys where we want them and not let the others get to where they're not supposed to be. So we use aseptic technique to keep pathogens out. That's what this really means. Get rid of the, keep no pathogens present in the bloodstream. Okay. So we use aseptic techniques all the time. Okay. Um, so we wipe the skin to decrease the amount of organisms that we might introduce into the, the bloodstream when we stick a needle into it. Um, we, wash our hands. We keep clean things where the clean things are supposed to go. The dirty things where the dirty things are supposed to go. I mean, like there's a whole lot of stuff that goes with this. Okay. Antiseptics. Um, antiseptics are chemical agents that you can apply directly to skin. Okay. Living tissues, um, <clears throat> to help prevent pathogens from growing in that area. So one of the things that we do a lot of is we, when we're doing surgeries, we use povidine iodine swabs. Um, if you've ever had blood drawn, um, you donated blood, they use the povidine iodine swabs before they stick that gigantic needle into your vein to take blood from you. Um, so that, that is a, a really good type of 
antiseptic. <coughs> um, notice it says swabbing open root canals, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a toxin, right? It's toxic to cells, so it it causes some really bad problems. It won't allow them to replicate, and it, it destroys them. Um, hand washing with germicidal soaps. So uh, with, there's a lot of chlorhexidine soaps out there. There are BZK wipes. Um, so there there's a lot of different uh, things out there. So is Lysol an antiseptic? Uh, no, because we don't use Lysol on our skin. Use Lysol on inanimate objects. Okay, so inanimate objects, not living tissues, that's a disinfectant, not an antiseptic. Antiseptics, living tissues, disinfectants, inanimate or non living tissue, non living objects. Okay, so <clears throat> what can happen? Um, what, what can affect our disinfecting, sterilization of the processes that we have to try to get rid of these organisms? How many do we have? Because the more that there are, the harder it is going to be to destroy them. Is there a complex uh, group of them? So it ha is it a biofilm? Do we have a community of many different species there? So if there's more than one species, it can be harder to, to destroy them than if there's just one. Do they make endospores? Is it a fungus and makes actual like asexual and sexual spores that that get released everywhere and fly in the air? Um, what environment is it that we are trying to uh, target these things in? So is it in the body, outside of the body? Um, is it a cold area? Is it a warm area? What's the nature of the material that we are trying to disinfect? Right. Uh, the agent that we're using is what's the concentration of it? Is it, is it a very weak re concentration? Is it a high concentration? Is it somewhere in the middle? Um, how does it actually kill or inhibit? Okay, because there are basically five different modes of action for the agent. One of them is to uh, attack cell walls. Um, one of them is to deal go after dna um or protein synthesis so is it the go after the ribosomes and and you destroy the protein synthesis you you go after the the enzymes that work um to put all the nucleotides together to make dna or rna um you have they won't allow i already talked about cell wall so they're not allowing the cell wall to be built to for the nags and nams to come together and complex together for that peptidoglycan um there are some that affect the permeability of the cell membrane itself so then what it does is then the cell will explode because it allows too much water or too many ions to come in there there's a bunch of different ways that these things can affect um the cell so the modes of action do we have other stuff there that we have to worry about? Is there a bunch of mucus or, or blood or guts or poop, whatever? Is there anything there that's going to inhibit the disinfectant or antiseptic? Um, the temperature can affect this. And I, it says it earlier, the temperature and the pH, really important to know what's going on. Okay, so um, <clears throat> least selective agents. So if it's selective, that means it's going to pick and choose what it's going to go for. So if they're if they're not very selective, they're going to have the widest range of microbes that they're effective against. Okay, they're going to be able to target a whole mess of them. Heat and radiation are really good at that. Okay. Selective agents target a single cellular component. Drugs and some disinfectants are that way. So if they're targeting parts in the cell, cell wall, cell membrane, those synthetic processes, um, proteins, okay, ribosomes, 
protein synthesis enzyme activity. Okay. So <clears throat> methods of physical control. So physical means of controlling microbes. Okay. Physical means of controlling microbes. So you, you can use hot or cold. Okay. Um, Hot temperatures kill, cold temperatures control, okay? Hot temperatures kill, H and K are very close in the alphabet. Cold control, all right? So what does that mean? So really hot temperatures, you, you need to get your meat to a certain temperature to be sure that it is safe to eat. There are no more living critters in there, right? Um, you, if you burn it with flame, it, yeah, they're definitely going to die. In, incineration will kill them. Um, we put it in a dry oven for a certain period of time, right? You put the turkey in the oven and make sure that it gets to a certain temperature so that you know that it's safe to eat. You've heard this before, right? So heat kills things. Okay. The cold temperatures will inhibit them. So that means that it controls them and it keeps the, the multiplication and rep and reproduction at a lower level. Okay, so cold things, we keep things in the refrigerator to try to keep them for a longer period of time. Now, if you keep milk in the refrigerator for two months is it gonna be good in two months are you gonna be able to drink it if you like sour milk yeah okay but um it's going sour right the thing's been pasteurized so we decrease the amount of path pathogens that are in it anyway but there's still a few organisms in there we keep it in the refrigerator that's why you don't leave sip milk sitting out on the counter you could keep putting it back in the refrigerator to keep it for some time and that's why there's a sell by date on it and some places in some places put there's a drink by date on some of them it just depends on who makes it and puts it out okay so microbostatic meaning that it's going to inhibit that microbial growth okay so that's physical means now there's radiation and filtration and ultrasonic waves and we're going to talk about those in a bit okay so there is a danger zone for temperature okay from 40 degrees fahrenheit to 140 degrees fahrenheit is what we call the danger zone when we're talking about food safety food safety is anything between um refrigerator where you're refrigeration temperature stops okay um to where your lowest temperature of meat temperature should be is is the danger zone that's where they are multiplying these organisms that typically inhabit your food stuff are multiplying like crazy so you do not take your meat and you leave it out at room temperature for forever because we're in trouble then. things are growing like crazy in there and you know e coli can grow very very quickly um 20 20 minutes 15 to 20 minutes for a generation time if you recall so ground meat is worse than roasts just saying um but Moist heat, you steam things, you boil things, you put it in hot water, right? That you steaming, this is the autoclave thing. Remember, the autoclave has to stay at 121 degrees Celsius for at 15 pounds per square inch of pressure for 20 minutes, and that destroys things, right? You've heard this before. Um, dry heat can be open flame, it could be hot air, it could be an oven, okay? Um, we have incinerators in our labs that are uh, very, very, very hot. The, the inside of the incinerator, it's actually a ceramic heating element. Um, they go in, in thousands of degrees. It's correct operating temperature starts at 960 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty darn hot. 
it will incinerate the things. You, you can actually hear the bugs pop when you put them in there. Um, <clears throat> so, bacterial endospores, of course, are very resistant to th these wonderful things, okay? Um, but you need to have uh, very high temperatures to be able to destroy spores. And technically, we really like to see that pressure with the temperature to be able to destroy those spores. Metabolically active, normal living cells, um, some of them like colder temperatures than others. So, you know, it just depends on what happens there. Okay. Uh, there, there's these wonderful, stupid terms. The thermal death time is the shortest amount of time that's required to kill a, an organism at a specified temperature. Okay. Um, so if I hold it at 100 degrees Celsius for five minutes, it kills them all. Okay, great. That's the thermal death time. If it's at three minutes, it's only going to kill 50% of them. So that's not effective. Thermal death point is the lowest temperature that can kill all the organisms in a sample for in 10 minutes. Okay. So point is temperature. Time is time. Really hard right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> effects of cold and desiccation. Okay. Cold, look, cold does not kill. Cold controls, right? We talked about this already. So cold slows down the activity of the, the microbes. So it slows the growth and the replication and, and the reproduction. Okay. Some organisms can live in freezing temperatures. Okay, so it is possible to get a foodborne illness from something that came out of your freezer. Okay, Listeria monocytogenes likes cold stuff. It likes saline. It likes osmotic pressure. It likes um, cold temperatures. So even though it's been refrigerated or even in the freezer, um, it is very possible to get foodborne illnesses from these things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, really, really, really super cold temperatures, less than 70 degrees Celsius, will stop all replication, reproduction. It will keep them preserved for very, very long periods of time. Okay. So, psychro is the same as cryo. They like cold. Okay. They grow, they can grow at freezing temperature, but they're slow, but they grow. Okay. Um, like I said, these things will grow in the refrigerator. Okay. You guys have seen molds and yeasts crop up on things that you had stuffed in the back of the refrigerator at some time, right? Um, some of the clostridioides, like Clostridium botulinum, um, Staph aureus, uh, Listeria monocytogenic, these things can grow there in the fridge. Desiccation is free, is complete drying. Okay, so to dehydrate things and remove all of the water from something, it will keep your organisms dried out. And what you can do um, is you can actually get rid of some of these things by drying them. Okay. That's one. The other thing is you can also control their growth by just, you dehydrate them and then later you can rehydrate them and they'll grow again. That's interesting stuff. Okay. Lyophilization is freeze drying. Okay. So what we do, if we hold these things, uh, um, it, we can hold these things in the bounce back state so that we, they, we can regrow them and they can, they can be used over and over again many years from now if we lyophilize them. So what you do is you freeze it first um, and then you remove all of the water from it. Okay, that's why it's called freeze drying and not dry freezing. Okay, um, basically they turn into like a little powdery substance 
um, and then you put the powdery substance into nutrient broth and they will become viable in about 20 minutes. Radiation, there are different types of radiation. There's ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Oh my goodness, what the heck does that mean? Um, ready? Here we go. Ionizing radiation will remove ions or pr produce ions by um, removing electrons or gaining electrons, right? That's not a good thing, just so you know. We though that would be your X rays and your gamma rays. Those that's the radiation that we want to protect ourselves with lead to keep that from hitting our cells and making all kinds of weird radicals in our cells that could cause damage to our cells. So we we irradiate a lot of our drugs. Um, we irradiate plastic equipment that we need to use, um, surgical materials, okay, things of that nature. Non-ionizing radiation would be ultraviolet radiation. And you guys know that UV radiation can be detrimental to cells, yes? And you know that you can use UV radiation to sanitize things, right? So you can, there's, UV little things that you can put on your toothbrush to try to control the amount of organisms that, that are growing on your toothbrush and things like that. You've heard this before, I hope. Um, we have UV cabinets that all of our, our eyewear, like the protective eyewear that we use, the goggles and the, and the safety glasses that we use in school. We have UV sanitization cabinets, so we put them in there and then we run the UV on it so that it helps to keep people from getting pink eye if they had to use it behind someone else. Um, we the UV radiation is very very common across the board. We use it in food prep areas. Um, hospital rooms tell you where it's really common in elevators. Okay, you'll notice that the, the lights don't shine directly on you typically. Um, dental offices, wonderful. Put your hands out on a sunny day. It helps to reduce the microbes that are on your skin. Do you really want to do that? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on how dirty your hands are and how often you wash them. Okay. Um, filtration. Filtration is so effective that it can actually, um, we can get filter pore sizes so small that we can actually remove viruses and large proteins. So. Filtration is only as effective as the pore size. So filtration is you, you move a substance through a filter, right? And whatever fits through the pores of the filter gets through to what we are going to use. Okay. So um, we can use filtration for liquids uh, that, that we can't chemically treat or not going to be able to use heat or, or um, radiation and stuff on. So uh, filtration is, is a very effective means of controlling microbial growth. Okay. Osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure. We add sugar or we add salt. And when we do that, we create a hypertonic environment, which keeps the cells from being able to multiply because what ha what will happen is that the, a lot of the cells will lose water from inside of them because the water leaves the cells and moves into this hypertonic environment. So um, again, this is not a sterilization thing. It is a control measure and I, it will keep your food stuff very good for a very long time. 